Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first, I have to apologize. I don't know much Spanish, so the entire speech will be delivered in English. But I'm really glad that there is simultaneous translation. The moment I heard that there will be simultaneous translation, I thought this is going to be a very interesting uh, talk and a very interesting audience because you would understand everything I'm trying to deliver. So, um, on behalf of ISIS Innovation, I would like to thank you very much for giving us this opportunity, um, for bringing us here in order to deliver this speech and also uh, the workshop uh, that we conducted in, um, at the University of Vigo yesterday and the day before yesterday. Uh, I think the, uh, the speeches or the introductory uh, talks uh, delivered by, um, mainly by Antonio, uh, Carlos and Emilio uh, sets up the scene uh, very well for this, this talk. And the reason why we chose this topic here, um, we quite didn't want to call it models of innovation. The reason for that is innovation has been used and abused over the past 10 to 15 years. There has been a lot of buzz about innovation. There has been a lot of skepticism as well. And the reason is because people don't understand what innovation is to begin with and what are the core components that you would need to establish in order to make innovation work. And therefore, I have included the technology transfer in the middle here just to show you that this is core to innovation. It can be only a part, but it is a very important part. And you will see why as we move through the presentation. OK, so this is an overview of what I am going to be talking about. But first of all, I thought, since I'm standing in front of you and delivering this talk, you might want to know who I am and where I'm coming from. Then I'll move on to the core of the presentation, starting with what is innovation and what is technology transfer, and how these two are intermingled or intertwined. I will then move on to university technology transfer innovation. How universities and technology transfer must come together to make innovation work. And then we'll also look at industry, which is the opposite spectrum industry and technology transfer for innovation. As Antonio mentioned, there is a massive gap between the universities and industry. When I go into different countries, when I conduct training sessions, I hear the same thing. We have a big problem. The industry does not want to interact with us because they think universities are a real pain to deal with because they are slow-moving, large organizations, Businesses are fast moving. They want to get things done quickly. So there's a big culture change, culture clash. So let us have a look how we have overcome this problem. And let's talk about what Oxford's solution was to this. And then we'll move on to something called Global Innovation Index, which was actually formed by world's two well-known uh, well organizations in order to measure innovation. So that is just to give you an idea what sort of measures should we take into consideration to measure innovation and what we shouldn't. Because what you can see out there is a lot of countries, a lot of governments, a lot of departments take into consideration certain criteria and measurements that are not the actual measurements of innovations. They are just outputs. We will move into a case study, Singapore. Singapore made this work, and they took very little time. Little country, about one and a half million people, very, very little resources to work on, grow on, but they came up with a strategy, and it worked brilliantly. And they're leading the innovation index in Asia now. Let's have a look at that, finally, before moving on to questions and answers. OK, a bit of my background, uh, professional background. Well, as you all know, I'm from ISIS Innovation. 
Um, I've been working there for the past three years as a senior consultant within the ISIS Enterprise Division. So I've been to a lot of countries while working for ISIS Enterprise, because what we are doing is ISIS Enterprise does not work directly with Oxford Academics or Oxford IP. We work with external organizations delivering our expertise and delivering our experience to other organizations, which is why we are here today. While doing that, I have traveled to Latin America, I have traveled to various countries in Europe, I have traveled to Asia in order to try and understand what cultures do exist, what are their innovation agenda, where do they succeed, and where do they fail, and where are they in terms of technology transfer. And whether I'm here in Spain, or whether I'm in Mexico, or whether I'm in Malaysia, I hear the same story. So whenever I deliver training sessions here and I hear people complaining, oh, in Spain it's like this, I say Spain is not alone. This is a global problem. These problems exist everywhere. <coughs> so rather than us keep complaining, let us have a look at how we can solve those problems. What can we do in order to get rid of those problems so we can make innovation work? So, during the past three years, I've gathered a lot of experience working in different countries and understanding what these different cultures are trying to do. Overall, I have more than 10 years of experience in technology transfer, commercialization, and innovation. Prior to ISIS innovation, I worked for University of Warwick's technology transfer unit. University of Warwick, again, is a small university, but they are in the top 10 universities in the UK every year. Mostly in the top five or six, without a doubt. And when I worked there for two years, that's where I got to um, directly involve in technology transfer from a university side of it. So I got direct experience there. Prior to that, I worked in a company called Innovation Exchange as a consultant for two years initially in Australia, and then shortly back in the UK. So here, this company is a um, technology brokering company. They have a look at technology providers or generators, such as universities, and they connected these technologies with companies or technology seekers and helped them to commercialize. This is where I learned the most. I co-founded this company straight after my PhD. And I think I am a good role model to the students because students always approach me and say, we don't have any business experience. We are science students. We don't know about writing business plans. We don't know about anything about intellectual property. When I first started putting this company together, I was in my second year of PhD. I had no idea what a business plan was. I had no idea what a patent was. And at the time, this was back in 2001, 2002 period, technology transfer was not well known. I, had, I hadn't heard about this particular uh, phrase that you use as technology transfer. So I had to learn everything myself the hard way, making mistakes and learning and moving on without feeling bad about it and giving up. So I co-founded this company, ran it for four years as the chief executive officer, and that's where I got exposed to commercialization because I was really interested. Although I was working here for one year as a postdoctoral research fellow, I was always questioning, is generating knowledge itself is sufficient? We just have to transfer this knowledge into industry. That's when people will make use of it. Because what we are using in a university environment is basically taxpayers' money if it's government funded. So why don't we give something back to them? So I ran that company. It was a very good experience for four years. I was involved in capital raising, raised over a million Australian dollars. This is straight after being a PhD student, so if you think you can, you can do it. In terms of educational background, um, I did my PhD back in Australia at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology University. Before that, I did a graduate diploma at the same institute for one year. Bachelor's degree was um, done in Bangalore, India. 
and I did my primary and secondary school education in Colombo, Sri Lanka, where I'm originally coming from. So that's enough about me. Let's move on to the topic. What is technology transfer and innovation? Before moving into technology transfer, we'll have a look at what innovation is, how it is defined out there. Right? If you Google innovation or definition for innovation, you'll come across many, many, many definitions. Right? Because some of those definitions are correct, some of them aren't quite correct, some of them are not correct at all. But let us have, in its simplest form, innovation is the creation of new or rearranging the old in a new way. That is the simplest definition, right? It may be right, it may be wrong, but it's in the ballpark, right? But if we want to uh, go more deeper, you have these other definitions which you can see here, but let's not get there because we don't need all these, right? However, it is important to understand what open innovation is because this is core to today's world. This is core to universities as well as industry. And this is where today's universities have the biggest opportunities because the innovation is more open now, at least from the industry point of view. Okay? So originally this, this term was coined by a professor known as Henry Chespro, who you may have heard of, um, some time ago, about a decade ago, um, he's a professor at the University of California, Berkeley. He wrote a book on open innovation. And I strongly recommend you read that book. It is very good. However, what is the difference between innovation and open innovation? Open innovation is a model that assumes that industry, companies, organizations, or firms can and should use external ideas, external to the organization or entity, as well as internal ideas, right? And I will explain why this is different to what it was in the past as we go along. And if you want to give a more academic sort of definition, you can define it as the use of purposive inflows. Purposive means you want it. Purposive inflows, or you mean it, or outflows of knowledge to accelerate internal innovation and expand the markets for external use of innovation, respectively. So, there is a, the new imperative for creating and profiting from technology, which is open innovation. And today's technology transfer, licensing, if you take in licensing, out licensing, spin-out company formation, startups, most of that rely on open innovation. And when I give this talk uh, to some audiences, they say it's not new, open innovation is not new, it's always been there. I disagree to a large extent. It wasn't really there a long time ago, and I will exactly demonstrate why it wasn't there some time ago. Okay, so let's have a look at the basic idea about innovation and technology transfer. Now here, what you can see are technology generators or technology providers. And on the other side of the spectrum, you have technology seekers. The entities are, who are the powerful generators of technology or powerful generators of knowledge? They are the universities, they are the research institutes, government research labs, small to medium organizations or enterprises, as well as large companies, right? They are generating new technologies, new knowledge. On the opposite side of the spectrum, you have technology seekers. They can be new startup companies. They can be small to medium enterprises. They can be spin-out companies from other entities, or they can be large companies. But if you generalize the two extremes of this, you can see that this is the research base, that this is the commercial base, right? Which is why say, we say that there is a gap that exists between that we need to bridge. These two entities should start to collaborate. They st should start to interact. And that's when smooth technology transfer will occur 
across from one entity to the other. So, and in the middle, we have put another box in our experience. So there are facilitators, there are entities who want to make this happen for several reasons. There are the governments who are pushing universities to commercialize, to come up with new inventions, to file patents, to spin out companies, because that helps the national economy. Research funders. Research funders would like to see the projects that they fund is being used by the society for the health and the wealth of the society. Investors, they want to see this transition happen so that they can get a return on their investment. Science parks. Science parks facilitate this process. Science parks exist in almost all universities in the UK, very close to uh, a place very close to the universities, where they use these parks in order to incubate new companies coming out of the universities, or new companies that are originating in the area, so that they are concentrated in, into one park or, or a single site. And who are the other facilitators? TTOs, Technology Transfer Offices. These technology transfer offices mainly occur in universities nowadays. However, if you have a look at big companies, if you have a look at government organizations, and even some large hospitals, you will see some sort of technology transfer function. And they are there in order to facilitate this. However, what is one of the biggest problems that we have come across that is existent everywhere is that when technologies come out of this entity, they are pretty early stage. They are not commercial ready. They need further development, right? Which is why we are indicating the technology readiness level on a scale from one to 10 here and maturity in terms of ideas, idea running into a product, product running into a company who actually commercializes it. So when inventions are coming out of a university or a research institute, they are pretty much around that area. And companies want uh, inventions that are around this area, or they would prefer if they're very close to seven or eight in the technology readiness level. Now, this is a problem everywhere in the world, global problem. They don't know, or they don't do anything, or they don't have the funding or the skills in order to make this translation so that companies become interested. One big problem, right? So we call it the valley of death in English, right? Valley of death, where everything's going to die, right? So in order to bridge that valley of death, what do you need? You need skilled people in order to, in order to make sure that it is not going to die. We know how to do it. We know what needs to be done in order to move the research into that domain so that companies become interested. Secondly, you need funding to do that. So how do you manage a sensible fund in order to move research from here to here? Third problem, how do you choose the right projects so that you have the right idea to move forward and not something that's going to die here even after spending a good amount of money? So the basic idea here is you need to find ways to bridge this gap. And there are problems that exist, and these problems are global. It exists everywhere. It exists at Oxford. We have solved it to a large extent, but smaller universities really struggle, even in the UK and in the US. Okay? So once you've bridged that gap, you can commercialize you can source and develop new technologies. The more resources you put here in order to address the problems there, you can commercialize more. You can transfer more technology, more knowledge, and you can source and develop new technologies by companies in, in, the, in the country. So what we do at, at ISIS is we work as skilled translators for the University of Oxford. So that was our first function when ISIS started 25 years ago. 
So what did ISIS do in the first place? They hired skilled people who have worked in industry, who had done a PhD or at least master's level, so that they understood the university culture as well as the industry culture. Because they are two different domains, they are two different cultures, you are in the middle, you have to bring them together. So, and how long did it take for Oxford to make this a success? It took them 10 to 13 years. And this is a core message that I give to every audience. Because if you have a look at the newer universities, they have set goals and objectives for tech transfer officers that aren't going to be realizable for five to 10 years. But they're asking the tech transfer office to do it within two years. Impossible. Even if you provide all the resources that a tech transfer office needs, you have got enough funding, or more than, more than the funding you actually require, you have the best people who can transfer technology, it will still take five years to produce tangible results. That's the nature of the beast. So the, the key message here is that start and don't stop. It will take time, be persistent, and support it totally. Okay, so why are we talking so much about innovation today? Why are we talking so much about technology transfer? Why is there a need in order to do that? Why is there a need in order to facilitate? But as you can see here, we are thinking globally today. Right? It's a very competitive world. It's become very small because of the advancements in media, in communication, and technology. Let's have a look why, why this need has come into existence. Let's have a look at the past to begin with, right? In the past, the scenario was economic power was built on manufacturing capability, especially in the Western world. Manufacturing brought them the, uh, the wealth to the, to the economy, right? And it was mainly dependent on semi-skilled labor with a very small, highly skilled population. However, the trend is that over the last 50 years, it has shifted. And you can't survive on the manufacturing world, on the manufacturing environment anymore. Why? Because it has moved from one region to another region in the world. And it, in search of low-cost labor, the least amount of government regulation and the most attractive tax structure. And why do you think that China or India are dominating in this domain now? Because of those three factors, right? So, what are the alternatives? That's why the need has risen. That's why there is a need to search for alternatives. So what are the alternatives? If manufacturing is no longer a significant economic option, what else can we look at? Is it the only way? No, we can look at two other models, right? One is service-based economies. But there's a small problem with service-based economies, right? When the service-based um, ventures dominate other ventures, manufacturing and knowledge-based. One of the problems is they mainly employ a semi-skilled base, right? So wages are relatively low, and there is less opportunity for social mobility and career growth. So if you look into the past, a lot of people, you know, they did the same job for decades and decades, right? And service-based economies have this characteristic, have this trend. And because it's semi-skilled, their wages are low, and therefore the tax base is low compared to the more advanced economies. So that's one of the alternatives. What, what is the other alternative? It's to look at knowledge-based economies. So the knowledge-based economies is the new product of choice for many countries. Why? Because it provides a better opportunity for bright, ambitious young people who can really excel in their careers because it's based on the intellectual capacity, it's based on the knowledge and, and passion for what you're doing. So it provides 
it also provides more potential to grow the economy faster and create a larger uh, tax, tax base. And I will prove this point by taking a case study towards the end of this presentation, why this works, why this really works in today's world. Okay, so, in order to stay competitive in changing markets, today's companies or today's economies need to develop new markets, they need to develop and improve new brands and reputation, they have to offer customers and societies new benefits, new ways of doing things in order to make their lives more comfortable. Ultimately, they need to sustain and grow business for economic growth and welfare. And that's why there is such a big need to build a knowledge-based economy. And in most of the countries, the government takes the initiative. They provide various funding schemes, tax breaks, etc., etc., in order to facilitate this. So that's why there is a need in order to create the knowledge-based economy in many countries nowadays. Okay, so going back to the traditional innovation management, this is what it used to be. This is what it used to be in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, before that, and slightly later than that. In companies, traditional innovation management involves R&D department developing products within the company. They weren't quite focused on any, anything to do with external to the company. Everything was done by an R&D base that was paid by, employed by, supported by the company itself. So how did they grow in the past is the argument. But they had a mechanism to grow, which is still, which is still pretty existent. It is mergers and acquisition activity in order to grow. So if they wanted a, a, a better R&D base or if they wanted to expand and grow, they merged with other companies, or they simply paid a big sum of money and bought them. So that's how companies, mainly in the past, grew. And that's how they um, became bigger companies, from being smaller companies to bigger companies, and improved their revenue, improved their growth and globalization. And this is a representation of that what happened in the past. So as you can see, it's a box. The company is boxed, right? Limited ideas from outside. They are very closed, and they are very careful about bringing out ideas from, ideas from the external world. And one thing was because they developed everything in there and they manufactured themselves, which is why it used to be a manufacture-based industry, because they knew how to do everything themselves. So everything was based on internal innovation as opposed to external innovation or open innovation. So technology and research base was within the company. The product development base was within the company. Ideas and requirements originated in the company internally, and new products were coming out of the company which were fully developed internally. Right? So as you can see, it's a very closed system. There is hardly anything to do with the external world. So just imagine how the university, university, if they wanted to interact when the case was like this, how difficult it would be for universities to commercialize anything during this era, right? So what companies were really focused in this stage what they really want to do was to optimize internal flows of knowledge and information. They want to make sure they were not worried about the rest of the world. They were worried about, okay, how did information flow from the technology research group to the product development group? How can we improve the efficiency here? And how can we make that efficiency flow through to the product development? How can we efficiently get something from here to here and into the market as soon as possible? That's where they tried to focus their attention on. But let's, ask, let's see how that changed. And because of these reasons, 
what, there were disadvantages. There were things that was not sustainable. The drawbacks were it was insular. It was not responsive to the environment. Because they were not open to ideas, they were not open to technologies, they were not open to innovations coming from external to the company, they didn't have the chance to develop something new that's external to the company. They had to rely on their internal R&D base. They had to rely on their five or six scientists and their knowledge, which is very limited. Okay? And they focused too much on efficiency and that killed creativity, right? Efficiency of getting things done. I want this done as quickly as possible. I don't care how you do it, right? So that's where they spent most of their energy and time and funding, which kind of killed creativity, which could be innovation, okay? And arguably, it discourages an entrepreneurial spirit, right? So the reason why we put arguably is that probably not always. Right? Entrepreneurial spirit, it does not let you to go out and explore the world. And it does not let you go out and interact with other entities. It does not let you, to go, let you go out and interact with universities, which are the powerhouses of ge and generators of knowledge. So it was quite restrictive. It was closed technology, closed innovation. And that produced these as drivers for change. So what were the drivers? Competitiveness and globalization. Companies could not sustain to go on being closed because of the competition, globalization, emergence of new technologies that disrupted the closed system. Increasing development costs, right? They had to pay this R&D base a whole lot of money if they were to start a new area of research. It was much cheaper to get it from somewhere else and incorporate it into their products and services. Yeah? So, it again drove for change. Increased mobility of skilled workers, right? Leaving corporate R&D. And that was another trend that happened. Most of these workers left company R&D. Why? because it wasn't open, right? They were restricted. Just imagine as an academic, you're restricted. You can't think freely. It kills you, right? As an academic, you should be able to think freely. You're a free man, free thinker. You think, you strategize, and then you do your research. And because of that, this trend, trend emerged. They started moving into universities. They started moving into other companies or other institutes where they were freer to do their research. Expansion of venture capital, right? This helped new companies to come through and become more competitive and create competition. That was another factor. External options for unused technologies, very important. You take any big company in the world, any research institute, let's say IBM, Apple, Samsung, GSK, Pfizer, you have a set of patterns that is core to their business that brings in the revenue. And then you have a set of patterns that's not doing nothing because it's not core to their business. Can they make money out of it? Yes, they can. Do they want to? Yes, they want. But under the closed system, they couldn't do it. Right? And that was another driver for change because they thought, okay, fine, I've got another set of patterns here. We are not using it, but can we either sell it or transfer that technology to some other entity, charge them some money, additional revenue. You know, the entity receiving it is, is a winner, we are a winner. Why don't we go towards an open system? So these were the drivers for change. Okay, so let's have a look at some important features of open innovation. I've listened to a lot of talks on open innovation. They talk at a very superficial level. They do not address the core activities, the core features that make it work. In our experience at Oxford, there are certain things that's core for innovation to happen. So I'm mainly talking in this talk about universities and industry, but there is the government. So I'm not talking about the government initiatives in this talk because 
I could probably talk for a good two or three days because of policy, etc., etc. But I'm addressing the core features here of open innovation where industry and universities can collaborate. So, in terms of active intellectual property management, so for example, licensing to transfer technology, this became a mechanism, an, an efficient mechanism, licensing, rather than developing in-house, right? So this underpinned open innovation. Out-licensing agreements, patent sales and joint ventures and spin-out spin out or spin-off companies. Again, platform technologies licensed exclusively to different markets, right? You can maximize the value coming out of IP from an entity by doing this. And important feature of open innovation that you may not have heard elsewhere. And also, open innovation has less dependence on centralized R&D, especially for mature technologies, right? It's because it's more collaborative, it's more, more happy to do with collaborative R&D with universities and other companies, right? So less dependence on centralized, you know, one team R&D. It enables you to launch ventures using internal and external technologies because it's an open system as opposed to a closed system. It focuses more on configuring or modifying or customizing technology and external supplier relationships. So it's a more open system, and the reason why companies were not open was they hadn't realized that you could come up with certain mechanisms to safely interact with the external world. So in terms of knowledge transfer or technology transfer, what we are addressing today in today's world are what are the mechanisms? Who are the best people to get on board in order to make that happen? That's what we are trying to address. Okay, so let's have a look at technology transfer. So technology transfer can also be defined more broadly as knowledge transfer because it's not only technologies, it's know-how. It's your, what you know that you can transfer as well for the wealth of the society. So if you go for a broad academic um, definition, tech transfer can be defined as the process of transferring. Now you can see it's not only one thing, it's skills, knowledge, technologies, methods of manufacturing. That's mainly know-how in terms of knowledge and methods of manufacturing. Um, and facilities among governments or universities and other institutions to ensure that scientific and technological developments are accessible to a wider range of users who can then further develop and exploit the technology into new products, processes, applications, materials, or services. Right? It's a very broad definition. And technology transfer as a whole is a very broad field because you have to deal with all these. And at Oxford, we do deal with all these. And we still sometimes make mistakes, learn from them, and then move on, continually refining the efficiency of how we do things and the way in which we develop our processes and make them quite workable. Therefore, technology transfer is an essential component in making open innovation work, in making it happen. Okay, so let's move on to the university side of things now and have a look at what is the university scenario. And then we'll look, at, look into the industry scenario and then we'll have a look at how they, these two should, should interact. Okay, so where does knowledge come from? Who are the most powerful generator? Who are the powerhouses of knowledge generation? It could be individuals in a country, any territory, it could be companies, it could be government research, but I say the most powerful knowledge generators in any country are their universities, their research base, the strongest research base. And let's have a look at the Oxford scenario. Now this is the 2010 research funding that came into University of Oxford. Okay? So as you can see, there is a lot that came from UK charities, there's a lot came from you know, research councils, 
uh, and then you know UK government and the National Health Service, the EU government, um, UK and overseas industry or companies, and other UK and EU overseas sources. So what you can see here is that the total external funding, which is all this, right, came up to 367 million. So this is just one year into 20, 2010. And then Higher Education uh, Funding Council for England provided 119 million to Oxford. So the total research spend in one year was 486 million. Okay? And how much ISIS did bring in terms of technology commercialization back in 2010? About 7 million. Okay? So that's an important message. You don't do technology transfer to generate and uh, you know, earn as much money as possible into funding. You do that as a function of the university because the university's mission is not to create and commercialize technologies. Their mission is to generate knowledge. Their mission is to conduct research. Their mission is to teach, right? So this is a function that the university sh should facilitate in order to help some of these funders realize their money back, including the taxpayers, right? Especially when it's government-funded money. So the point here is that, okay, Oxford is getting a lot of funding, and we had the highest research spend back in that year. In 2012, it was about 530 million. So what are we doing in terms of technology commercialization? Okay, here is what we have done. Now I will very quickly explain how the Oxford model works for technology transfer. This is very important to understand because they, this might make you think whether Spain should go this way, whether universities here should go this way or not, and culturally, whether you would agree with it or not, as Antonio pointed out. We have the University of Oxford here, and that's ISIS Innovation. That's external companies who we do business with. Okay? As you can see, ISIS is not a part of Oxford. It's outside Oxford. However, there is a box there. The box means that it is somehow connected to the university. ISIS is a company, right? It's a wholly owned company, 100% owned by the University of Oxford, that Oxford formed to transfer their technologies. Okay? And we'll see why they did that back in 1987. How the model works here is that when Oxford generates new intellectual property, or when they create a new invention, they assign it to ISIS. Assign means Oxford gives it to ISIS. So when they give it, Oxford is not the owner anymore. ISIS is the owner of IP. Right? If you have a look at all the patent applications that we have filed anywhere in the world, ISIS is the applicant, not University of Oxford. Okay? So university transfers the IP to ISIS Innovation, and it is ISIS's responsibility to commercialize them to the external world. Now here you can see a license back. Now this is very important if you are creating an ISIS-like entity. What we are licensing back is something very important to the university and the academics and to the university research, and that is when you assign the IP, when you transfer the IP, ISIS has the full rights to that IP. Okay? So by licensing back, what we give back to the university is that, okay, we realize that we have got your IP in ISIS, but in return, we are going to give the rights back to you to use this IP for research and teaching purposes, including non-commercial use. Because just imagine, you transfer all the IP from Oxford and you have to close down whole projects because you don't own the IP anymore. You can't work on those anymore, right? Very important point that you have to understand if you are looking at this model. And this model is very important, which I'll explain in the next slide. Okay, so make sure that that is addressed. 
So once IP, uh, ISIS owns the intellectual property, we license it to other companies. We uh, spin out our own companies in order to transfer the knowledge, in order to transfer the technology. And the other um, important point that I want to raise here is that if a university happens to form this kind of entity, do make sure that they work very closely with the university hand in hand and not see each other as competitors right, or rivals because it wouldn't work. And the, the way we work is University of Oxford has a small entity called Research Support Services. Every university has this office. They are the uh, office who helps the researchers in their grant applications. They manage the grants, their funds, etc., etc. In Oxford, Research Support Services also manages their IP. So when there's a little group that manages the IP, who actually is involved in transferring it to ISIS? So we have formed a very good relationship, very good working relationship in order to make it happen. So it's very important, again, your interaction with the university. Okay, so what have we done with all that funding coming in, in terms of filing patents, in terms of um, licensing, spin-out company formation? All, all in all, what have we done in transferring knowledge? Okay, here are some statistics. So we have about 1,250 patents and patent applications, 300 active licensing deals, Licensing partners basically selected on the resources and intent to develop technology to market. Now, I made this point again and again yesterday and day before during the workshop we did at Vigo. Universities have to be very careful about this. If the companies can't show that they have the resources or the intent to develop and market the technology, be very careful. This is where technology transfer fails if you don't license it to the right company. So at Oxford, we spend a whole lot of energy in order to try and work out that the, that the companies are actually going to develop our technology or invention, and they are actually going to make money out of it. So, and I, I pr pretty much explained the mechanism that we do it. Because of the time, um, uh, I'm not going to run through that at the moment, but at the workshop, I definitely talked about this. So in healthcare, as a university's social responsibility, we say to companies, if you happen to develop this drug or vaccine, and if you're selling it to developing countries or poor countries, you have to make it available at a subsidized rate so that patients in those countries can benefit from the drug. Yeah? So that's a part of the ethical side of things. So when we license technologies, we charge them fees, milestones, royalties, appropriate to technology and marketplace. Right? And then we do a whole lot of valuations which we teach in our training programs. So how, with the royalties, who benefits? Researchers, university, department, and ISIS. And we charge a commission from our license income that goes into the uh, university, and that commission pays our salaries and administration and our day-to-day -day work. So that's how the whole model at Oxford works in a nutshell. Okay, so why did the university move into this kind of model? And it's not only Oxford. I think Cambridge, Imperial, MIT, lots of universities in the US have, uh, have moved into this model because of these very reasons. You have delegated authority from the university, right? So you can make decisions faster. You don't have to wait until the university's vice chancellor makes a decision to issue a license, right? It is a good way to manage risk. If something goes wrong commercially, right, another entity can't sue the university. They can sue ISIS. They can sue the technology transfer company. If it goes really bad, you can close down the company without damaging the university. So it's a good shield, a good barrier that where other entities can't attack the university if something goes wrong in the commercial domain, okay? Because technology transfer involves a lot of risks as well. It can behave like a business for other businesses. As it's a very important point, this one. Because a lot of businesses are quite 
skeptical about dealing with universities because universities are large, slow-moving organizations. And they are much happier to deal with another business like, who behaves like a company, who act very fast, who speaks their language. That's why they've created ISIS as a company at Oxford. And efficient decision-making, quite possible, right? Because there is delegated authority. There's transferred authority from the university in order to make decisions, right? And there are ways that Oxford manages this very carefully. But I can't go into that because it's a lot of information. Anyway, what are the disadvantages, right? May not be able to recognize the brand if it's not strongly associated to the university. Sometimes when I go into Asian countries, they think ISIS is a consulting firm from the UK. They don't realize it's from Oxford until we explicitly mention it. So now we are associating the Oxford logo with ISIS now, right? And this happened only last week, week before, something like two weeks ago. After 25 years, the university finally granted us the right to use the university logo with ISIS because they wanted to make sure that we would survive and we would do a good job without damaging the uh, Oxford's brand. So pretty much, I actually changed the logo today on this slide <laughs> because we've, asked, we've been asked to. So that, without that strong brand association, there may be confusion out there in, amongst companies. Who are you? Who is ISIS? That's one of the disadvantages. But if you are in the university, you go by, by the name of the university. Okay. The employees in the mother organization may treat it as an external entity. Now, sometimes this may be a problem because they might see ISIS, you know, the university academics might see ISIS as a separate company because they don't know inside out of whether it is a wholly owned company or whether Oxford pays and it's an external company that commercializes technology for the university. That confusion. Whereas if you're a department within the university, everybody knows that you're within the university. Delegated authority needs to be managed very carefully, right? Because you are making decisions on behalf of the university, which is a, you know, well-reputed, it's a good brand, you do anything silly, you're damaging it. So I'll quickly mention what university does. University professors, academic professors, are on the board of ISIS, so they keep an eye on what's going on, right? Our company lawyer is not an employee of ISIS. Company lawyer is seconded from the university into ISIS. So if there's something fishy going on, they will report back to the university. If we are making a wrong decision, they will record back, report back to the university. Our accountant is a secondee from the university. They're an employee of the university, not an employee of ISIS. They come and work in ISIS. They've got a desk there. So if there's anything going wrong or fishy in terms of the financials, they will report back to the university because of that. So, university has established certain mechanisms in order to mitigate that risk. That's how they manage it very carefully. And you, significant funding may be required in order to establish an ISIS-like entity. So that's the other disadvantage. Anyway, let's have a look at the general structure. What happens in most other universities who haven't followed this method? As I mentioned, in this case, it is a part of the university, a unit or a department within the university. It operates under the university's central administration, finance office, and contracts office. So at, at, as ISIS Enterprise, we are working with a number of other UK universities. And it's very frustrating, because this is the structure they are operating at. We've got used to our structure that works quite efficiently in comparison and when we go in there, in order to get approval, we have to go to the university's um, central administration, where the lawyer is. We have to go to the finance director to get their approval. And then we have to go to the contracts office get the, to get the contract signed. It takes a lot of time, and no wonder the companies are quite skeptical about universities. They get very frustrated because they have their timelines, and they're working on competition, and they want to get things done, things done quickly and move on. But when the university takes six months to sign a, put, put a single signature on, the deals fall through, a big gap. Most tend to be small offices with small teams of people because of the lack of funding and the lack of resources. Generally under-resourced, right? One or two people, sometimes no people. That's why they get ICs or more experienced universities to come and help them out. 
However, larger offices, some, uh, I think the University of Yale University in the U.S. has a large office. They under, uh, operate under this umbrella. But their structure is that they have different teams dealing with the same technology. Right? So one team has a look at the technology. They think, okay, we can patent this. And then they tra transfer it to the second group who markets the technology. And if there, if there is a company interested, they move it to the third one who actually negotiates the deal. Right? And we see a lot of problems there because you have to establish relationships with the company or with, with marketing um, at each stage. And you have to create the relationship with the academic. You have to create the relationship with the companies and think the, the possibility of a deal falling through is greater. Whereas in ISIS, all this is done by just one project manager. It's that project manager's responsibility to move the project all the way from the idea stage all the way to executing a license agreement or forming a spin-out company. So one person manages. So that's much more effective in our experience. So this is the scenario. You have the university, you have the central administration, you have different departments, and then you have the technology transfer office and it works quite well. However, looking at the advantages, you have the strong brand association. If ISIS was located within Oxford University, as a part of Oxford, we wouldn't call it ISIS Innovation. We would call it Oxford Innovation, or Oxford Technology Transfer, something like that, that is strongly associated with the university. Small teams can sometimes work very effectively. So if there are small teams, decision making is easy. There aren't too many people with too many opinions that complicate things. So some of these small offices can work quite effectively, can be an efficient model when good strategies and processes are implemented and followed. Right? So if you have a small team who work effectively and good strategies and processes are implemented and followed, this can work quite well. So if this is how some of the universities in Spain want to go, it can work very well. We are not saying that Oxford method should be the way but it depends on what you do with the problems, addressing the problems that can break deals. Right, so personnel in multiple divisions. For example, one team is dealing with IP protection, one team is always dealing with marketing and negotiation, and one te uh, team is dealing with uh, execution. So what, what can this do to the team very quickly? They get very skilled at it because they're dealing with one aspect all the time. So they might, be deal they might become very good at assessing technologies and picking up the good technologies that should be patented. Whereas only if a, one project manager is doing the, all this, the throughput is very low. Okay? So that's another advantage of that model. But what are the disadvantages? Now, I said I have worked in university tech transfer offices that used to be um, part of the university operating under that model, University of Warwick at the time. So after I left, after about a year, they spun out it as a company. So now they've got the ISIS model as a wholly owned subsidiary because of this. These were existent at Warwick. These were existent elsewhere, and I have seen it. So they can be very slow as there is no delegated authority. Majority of decisions are made by the university's central administration. So there is a director in the tech transfer office, but the director has no power whatsoever to make a decision. It has to be made by the university's central administration, because as you know, universities can be very bureaucratic, right? And everything has to go up there in order to be approved. And don't forget this either, the risk that the university will be running if it's a part, part of the university. The risks are there, direct risks as opposed to more delegated risks or managed risks. It, it's difficult, very difficult to behave like a business for other businesses because they always see as a university coming to talk to you rather than a company coming to talk to you. Deals can fall through due to delays and frustrations because of that, right? And slow, being, for being slow. And multiple divisions handling the same invention can pose many problems. As I mentioned before, all these people you know, they form a relationship with the academic, and then the marketing division has to form with the relationship with the same academic, and they have to form a relationship with the company that they are going to license it. 
It's very complicated. So to keep things simple, we get just one project manager to manage the, manage the entire project at ISIS. Okay. Right, so that's the university side of the story. Now let's move into the industry side of things and see what industry is doing in terms of innovation, in terms of bringing in technologies under the open innovation umbrella. So here we go. So this diagram was introduced by Professor Henry Chesborough, who coined the term open innovation about 10 years ago. And as you can see, the key point here is it is to represent where the firm's boundaries are porous. So there is information or technology innovation inflow as well as outflow to the pores. Okay? So as you can see, here you have the internal technology base, which always used to be the case under the closed system. And then you have the external technology base that you can bring in via technology transfer. And this is why I mentioned the universities are in a much better position today to interact with industry because they're open to this now. They have been for the past 10, 20 decades, right? And when you bring in external technology via in licensing or through consulting academics in universities, you can create new things, right? You can create new products and get into another firm's market and compete with them, right? And then you also can bring in internal technologies. You can go for venture funding so that you transfer the risk to an external entity in development, bring it back in, and then you can create new markets, right? And then you can also develop new technologies by bringing in technologies from universities. You put more funding, you put more expertise into it, develop, and you can license it to other entities. And then all this can also create your new, new inventions, new products, and new services to your existing market. So look at the possibilities that the open innovation model offers in terms of maximizing the value, in terms of growth, in terms of expanding your company. This wasn't the case before. And at the same time, have a look at the, uh, the, the opportunities that universities, the knowledge generators, the research generators have today in order to interact with the industry. And what is the core mechanism that facilitates this? It is technology transfer, right? And companies are quite open as far as we see. But the problem lies mainly in the university side as far as I see. Companies want to talk, but because of the models that are being used in universities, because of the slow response, because of the lack of skill base, because of the lack of resources, there's a gap here. But that gap is not only existent in Spain, it's not only existent in the UK, it still exists in the US, who first moved into this. But it's a matter of how big the gap is. It's different in different countries. And I was talking to um, one of the uh, yeah, attendees today before uh, starting this session, and you know, I'm, I'm very inspired by what Spain is trying to do. I've been here about five times now delivering training courses. Spain knows there's a problem here. And I've been to some countries, they don't know there's a problem. They're just happy with where they are. Economy is not doing that well. And they are not addressing any of this. So at least it's good to know. We know that you have a problem and you are trying to do something in that domain. And it's only a matter of time until you come up with the right strategies and you know, bringing in the right skill set and training the Spanish in order to make this thing happen, okay? So, it allows the flow of ideas and intellectual property in and out quite easily. That's what open innovation has facilitated. And that's why companies are quite open today. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the models that companies have developed. So I take IBM as an example here. So I hope everybody knows who IBM is, but do you know what it stands for? 
IBM. Well done, yes. International business machines. It's not innovative business models, don't get it wrong. <laughs> um, but, you know, IBM employees used to call it, I've been moved, because they used to move employees within IBM in the 1950s, 50s, and 60s very often within the company, from one department to another, one department to another. So they used to say, I've been moved is IBM, that's why I work there. So, anyway. Um, anyway, this fork model, first of a kind model, is an effective model. It's a tech transfer model that IBM has established. And remember I mentioned before that some companies have a stack of patents that they are really not doing anything with, that is not core to their business. They are using this method in order to push them out. That's why this is a new model for them. And it works quite effectively. So if you happen to read that book, it's called Innovation Passport, written by um, Mary Jo Federich and Peter Andrews. Um, I've, I've personally met the author at one of the conferences in London, UK. She's a very, very passionate individual. She said she has been developing this method for 13 years, and it's working very well for IBM. Right? So how it works is, IBM realized that they had some technologies that could be further developed, but it's not core to their business, right? But they wanted to come up with a way to derive value out of it. What did they do? They wanted to also to establish benefit, uh, to benefit IBM's clients as well as the company. So they understood that if they engaged with some of their clients, these technologies could be further developed. Therefore, she was given the task to develop a program. Basically, first of a kind program describes a complete process developed for successful identification, assessment, development, and transfer of technologies from IBM to the external world. Okay? It may involve some I, uh, IBM's intellectual property, it may involve some external client's intellectual property, they put, to put the two together and create something where IBM as well as its clients benefit at the end of the day. So it consists of three phases. So this is a very, very, very small description. I think this has about probably over 100 pages, so I'm just explaining in three lines here, just summarizing, concentrating what the process is. So phase one, they have a very linear process, very lenient process, um, where they identify, assess opportunities, and they submit it to a panel. Right? So the panel goes through these inventions and the proposals, right? and this panel consists of technologists, scientists, business people, engineers, and marketers, salespeople. They bring everyone together. Right, to create a winning team to assess these ideas. Right? And then they identify simultaneously, this is quite important, they identify the markets and the clients even before they develop anything. Right? So they do their market research and make sure they are actually addressing uh, an unmet need out there even before they do anything. Once they've identified that they are actually going to get m make money out of this, then they come up with a technology development plan. How are we going to develop it? How much money we are going to put in? How much money does the company, is the company going to put in? And then they establish the route to market and the transfer of assets. So sometimes they transfer the whole IP into the company and get them to pay a royalty to IBM. Works quite smoothly, been run, running for over a decade, and has been generating good value, pride, and energy for I IBM, right? So what I'm saying is that we are in the information age today. All the information is at our fingertips, right? So you don't need to, you know, go to Oxford, MIT, to learn all these groundbreaking, you know, processes. You can pretty much read books and get a very good understanding of how people work, how these companies succeed. A lot of information out there. So it depends how, how passionate you are about this. Read them, understand how these companies make it work, because most of the problems you're fa facing, they have the solutions. 
Okay, so that's uh, a quick look at the IBM's model. So, as much as technology innovation, where things fail is when you forget to innovate the business model, right? So business model innovation is core as well, right? Especially from an industry perspective. We are talking from, from the point of companies here. So what is the need to innovate your business model, right? Some of the reasons are what I mentioned before. You're moving from a manufacturing-based economy into a knowledge-based economy, okay? So unless you innovate your business itself, you're going to die. They used to say collaborate or die, but now they say innovate or die. So in order to survive in a competing global market, you need to innovate your business model itself. Okay, so in, in spite of the current global recession, companies worldwide continue to recognize the importance of sustainable growth, right? And research shows that growth into adjacent spaces, right? New distribution channels, new products, new countries, account for 75% of all growth strategies that companies use at the moment, okay? So that means they're looking, looking for new things to work on because if you keep working on the core things, the competition arises and you can't survive there anymore. So you have to move on to new things in order for the company to survive. And we are gonna have a look at a really fine example just in a moment. In 2008, IBM survey found that nearly all of the 1,100 corporate CEOs who voted reported the need to adapt their business models. More than 66% said that extensive changes were required. Companies have a big problem too in innovation. Okay? So this, is, this creates a big opportunity for universities. It's out there. So we have to get the university side of things right. This clearly shows the need, not only for innovating the tools used for innovation, but also innovating the very business models themselves. Okay? So let's have a look at these two words, adjacencies and white space. Very interesting. You read some Harvard business reviews, you read some um, you know, books read, um, you know, uh, written on these. Very, very interesting, but a very powerful model very difficult to pull off as well, okay? So let's have a look at a quick look at what those mean. This adjacencies and the white space area is essential when companies need something fundamental than new growth. They need renewal. They need to renew the way they are doing business. They need to renew their product portfolio, not really improve what they're already offering. That's what it means when they must evolve into companies that deliver new sorts of value in a new way that people are going to pay for, right? So one of the ways in pursuing this is via adjacencies. So what are adjacencies? Adjacencies include serving new customers or existing customers in a fundamentally different way, okay? And we'll have a look at some examples so that you will understand. Another way so-called the sazing, the white space. Who has ever heard about the white space? Okay, so white space means the uncharted territory. You haven't been there before as a company. It's something completely new to the company, right? Would mean, right, leaving from the comfort zone, comfort of their core business and pursuing opportunities outside the core business activities. Now, there are fine examples out there. Companies took the risk, went in there, and they did they made an, you know, evolutionary changes, right? Dying companies completely flipped around. And we are going to have a look at a case study very soon. But what does it need? It needs really good leadership. It needs a very good skill space, new strengths, and new ways to create value. It calls for the ability to innovate something more significant than the core business. That is to innovate the very theory of the business itself. It can be hard to pull off but not impossible. Okay, so let's have a look at, in a nice MBA sort of graph here. So here you have the opportunity, okay, the business opportunity, and here you have your customers, right? And you have products or services that is a good fit with your current business, 
right? So that's your core business that you've been doing forever. But there are things that is a poor fit with the current business for existing customers that who, are, who have been served in a traditional way. However, you also have you know, new customers or existing customers served in fundamentally different ways. As I mentioned, that's where the adjacency comes in. You're coming up with you know, new products as opposed to improved products. And then you have the white space here. Right? You're not familiar with it. It has a very poor fit with the business. But you identify there is an opportunity in the market and you put the right resources in place, like in licensing technologies from a university. Right? New, uni new technologies. And it creates a new marketplace for yourself that can probably you know, shoot up your growth. So let's have a look at these two. Let's have a look at the core business to begin with. Several initiatives can make this happen in a company, core business. Basically, you know, all the companies, what they do traditionally, accelerating innovation and R&D, all the internal initiatives, etc., etc., and implementing processes, hiring highly skilled workforce. Nothing different, right? However, more innovative companies are moving into that, which is the adjacency, right? And here are some examples. If you take IBM, they moved into global services, which brings about 50% of the company's revenue and pre-tax profits, right? So that involved growing new products and services. That's the adjacency they formed. Then Vodafone, right? Expanded from the UK to Europe, United States, Japan, and then to the rest of Asia. They're the biggest telecommunication company in the world. What did they do? Entering new geographies. Right? But they, sell, so they are selling the same products and services. That's why they are in adjacency. Right? De Beers extended its diamond business from wholesaling into retailing. Right? Expanding along the value chain. It's hard to pull off, but they did it. Right? Nothing different from what they're traditionally doing, but they just changed the way in which they deliver it. Let's have a look at the white space. Here we go. Very fine example. Now, moving into the white space with a biz new business built around a strong capability is the rarest and the most difficult move to pull off. A move to pull off, but possible, right? It's very difficult, but if you carefully structure it and make it work, it can do brilliantly. Now, let's have a look at a case study here who, you know, brilliantly did this, and that was Apple. And you all know Apple, iPod, uh, iMac, iBook, etc., right? Apple was once a major player in the personal computer market. That was their core business, right? Making and selling computers. Market share fell from 20% to less than 3% in the 1990s, right? Company settled into the role of a niche player. So they thought, okay, fine. Well, we'll play as a niche, not a major player, because, you know, we are going, going down the drain, basically. And that's when Steve Jobs, their visionary leader, and the co-founder returned from his little company that he was running called Pixar and was determined to put things right for Apple. And what did he come and do? Yeah, he worked in this area. He kind of worked in this area. But where did he make the transformation? Over here. Right? First step, core business innovation via product innovation. Rolled out the iMac. There were 15 different iMacs. He made it just one. There were as many iBooks. I he just made it one, right? That way, he reduced the cash burning in the, in the company, right? So if you have a look at the evolution of the iMac, that's the first version in 1998, right? But what was the innovation here? He integrated the processor into the, into the monitor, you know, fashion-forward, more business-like computer, and it has evolved to this stage, but we are mainly talking about this era. iBook, he made it like a clamshell, you know, made it a bit interesting, and all the Mac users fell in love with it and bought it. They were smash hits, right? The new products, iMac and iBook, were smash hits, but did very little to save Apple, right? Because the sales didn't shut up. Apple then introduced the iPod in 2001, the world's first digital music player, right? It revolutionized the consumption of portable entertainment, created an entirely new market, as we all know, set Apple on the road to exponential growth, right? And that, that happened. But what's the truth? 
the true story was Apple wasn't the first to bring a digital media player to market. It was Diamond Media who introduced the first MP3 player in 1998, two years, three years ago. Best Data also had introduced its version in 2000. It was called Cabo 64. So why did Apple's iPod revolutionize the music world? What was the difference, right? And you know, if you, took, if you looked at those MP3 players and the Apple's nice design, back, you know, the first iPod, not much of a difference, you know, uh, and the functionality and everything. But Apple did something far smarter than wrapping a good technology in a snazzy design. What was it? It wrapped a good technology in an innovative business model. And that innovative business model was in the white space. Apple was never into digital music media. They were not known as a digital entertainment provider. They were known as a computer maker, right? So, what was the great business model? Introduce the iTunes, making it easy to, and convenient to download to iPod and manage your own music. Just imagine, at the time, you know, we were carrying stacks of CDs, you know, in a, in a CD stack and a little player, and we were changing CDs. But just imagine with iTunes how easy it was to download and manage your music. It just changed the entire game. And also, 18 months after introducing the iPod, Apple launched the I iTunes Store, right? So 18 months later. And then, through the iTunes Store, you, sh you, ha you should have realized you know, how much Apple gained its um, uh, market share. So basically, Apple reversed, reversed the Gillette's great model of razors and blades by giving away the blades, you know, low-margin consumable iTunes, to lock in the purchase of the razor, basically, the iPod, right? So generally, when you buy a razor, you buy the blades, right? So they gave the blades first, and they sold the razor, which was more expensive. So brilliant model. So this business model, substantially different from anything Apple had done before, defined the value in a new way, right? The success of this business model innovation, you know, rejuvenated and transformed Apple, saved the company. It was in the white space. Look at that, just one point here. iPad was introduced, not much sales. iTunes was introduced, 3.8 um, billion, which shot to 7.2 billion, all the way to 133 billion within a few years. That's how powerful that business model was. Okay, in terms of the Global Innovation Index to measure innovation, INSEED is known as the world's business school. And the World Intellectual Property Organization basically came up with this Global Innovation Index rankings method. So if you have a look at the 2012 rankings, you can see these 10 countries top the Innovation Index. And look at number three here, Singapore. Right? The reason why I'm taking Singapore is because there are lots of things to learn. Why, why didn't I take Switzerland here? Switzerland is earning a lot of cash from their patents that are owned by their pharmaceutical companies, right? So their strategy worked for them. But you have to look at Singapore's strategy here. It's quite breathtaking and would address problems in most countries. It's an island um, country made of 63 islands just south of Malaysia, very small country, 5.2 million people, 63% citizens, 37% permanent resident and foreign workers. So they attract a lot of skills from external <coughs> world. World's fourth leading financial center. How did they get there? Third highest per capita income in the world. How did that happen? Number one Asia, in Asia, you know, leading in Asia, you know, on top of Japan, China, and all the other countries in the Global Innovation Index 2012. Why? Here is what they did. They established proactive schemes and coordinated efforts. That's why I've highlighted this. Coordinated efforts. Because it was a small country, the government could really align their policies. They could really align their efforts and focus, right? And a sum of 360 million was invested in 2008. And where, look where they got to in 2012. 
right? So they invested, that's not a lot of money, it's a small sum, but where did they invest? Right? Establishing support for academic entrepreneurship in universities. They hit the nail on the head because they knew exactly where innovations were coming from. Right? Creating enterprise support structures, enhancing technology transfer. Right? They directly addressed where the problems were. Right? And supporting innovation policy studies. So, what would make innovation make or break? Here are the core things in a country. And it is quite evident because Global Innovation Index is done by independent entities. They have looked at Singapore and said, right, you are the leader in Asia because you've just done the right stuff here. Okay, so in summary, innovation is critical to driving growth you know, in developed as well as developing world everywhere. Opportunities for innovation in a given country or territory are not uniform. So you have to work out a strategy addressing the exact problems that stopping innovation. The value chain of innovation should be further enhanced by several mechanisms, including formation of adjacencies and white space opportunities. So it's not the fam only the familiar territory. Take manageable risks and move into the unfamiliar territory because you never know. You might just be able to do what Apple did because it was a smart innovation, innovative business model. International, internationalization, partnerships, appropriate funding support, you know, driven by sensible policies, and fine-tuning of national and organizational policies and systems is critical, because this is where it breaks again, as far as we've seen. Policies that kill each other. Technology transfer is an important mechanism that underpins innovation. Understand, this is a very key point. Right? When we t when I have heard lots of talks about innovation without hearing this, trans this word once. Establishment of well-structured strategy that is coherent with coordinated efforts can accelerate the path to innovation. So coherent is very important. Coherent means you know, everybody's having the same focus. It's leading towards the same goal. So if the policies aren't made into you know, working coherently, the strategy is not going to work for a country. Thank you very much. Because I was really interested, although I was working here for one year as a postdoctoral research fellow, I was always questioning, is generating knowledge itself is sufficient? We just have to transfer this knowledge into industry. That's when people will make use of it. Because what we are using in a university environment is basically taxpayers' money, if it's government-funded. So why don't we give something back to them? So I ran that company. It was a very good experience for four years. I was involved in capital raising, raised over a million Australian dollars. This is straight after being a PhD student. So if you think you can, you can do it. In terms of educational background, um, I did my PhD back in Australia at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology University. Before that, I did a graduate diploma at the same institute for one year. Bachelor's degree was um, done in Bangalore, India, and I did my primary and secondary school education in Colombo, Sri Lanka, where I'm originally coming from. So that's enough about me. Let's move on to the topic. What is technology transfer and innovation? Before moving into technology transfer, we'll have a look at what innovation is, how it is defined out there. right? If you Google innovation or definition for innovation, you'll come across many, many, many definitions, right? Because some of those definitions are correct, some of them aren't quite correct, some of them are not correct at all. But let us have, in its simplest form, innovation is the creation of new or rearranging the old in a new way. That is the simplest definition. Right? It may be right, it may be wrong, but it's in the ballpark. Right? But if we want to uh, go more deeper, you have these other definitions which you can see here. But let's not get there, because we don't need all these. Right? However, it is important to understand what open innovation is, because this is core to today's world. This is core to universities as well as industry. And this is where today's universities have the big 
very, very little resources to work on, grow on. But they came up with a strategy, and it worked brilliantly. And they're leading the innovation index in Asia now. Let's have a look at that, finally, before moving on to questions and answers. OK. A bit of my background, uh, professional background. Well, as you all know, I'm from ISIS Innovation. Um, I've been working there for the past three years as a senior consultant within the ISIS Enterprise Division. So I've been to a lot of countries while working for ISIS Enterprise, because what we are doing is ISIS Enterprise does not work directly with Oxford Academics or Oxford IP. We work with external organizations delivering our expertise and delivering our experience to other organizations, which is why we are here today. While doing that, I have traveled to Latin America. I have traveled to various countries in Europe. I have traveled to Asia in order to try and understand what cultures do exist. What are their innovation agenda? Where do they succeed and where do they fail? And where are they in terms of technology transfer? And whether I'm here in Spain, or whether I'm in Mexico, or whether I'm in Malaysia, I hear the same story. So whenever I deliver training sessions here and I hear people complaining, oh, in Spain it's like this, I say Spain is not alone. This is a global problem. These problems exist everywhere. So rather than us keep complaining, let us have a look at how we can solve those problems. What can we do in order to get rid of those problems so we can make innovation work? So during the past three years, I've gathered a lot of experience working in different countries and understanding what these different cultures are trying to do. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, First, I have to apologize. I don't know much Spanish, so the entire speech will be delivered in English. But I'm really glad that there is simultaneous translation. The moment I heard that there will be simultaneous translation, I thought this is going to be a very interesting uh, talk and a very interesting audience, because you would understand everything I'm trying to deliver. So um, on behalf of ISIS Innovation, I would like to thank you very much for giving us this opportunity, um, for bringing us here in order to deliver this speech, and also uh, the workshop uh, that we conducted in, um, at the University of Vigo yesterday and the day before yesterday. Uh, I think the, uh, the speeches or the introductory uh, talks uh, delivered by, um, mainly by Antonio uh, Carlos and Emilio uh, sets up the scene uh, very well for this, this talk. And the reason why we chose this topic here, um, we quite didn't want to call it models of innovation. The reason for that is innovation has been used and abused over the past 10 to 15 years. There has been a lot of buzz about innovation. There has been a lot of skepticism as well. And the reason is because people don't understand what innovation is to begin with and what are the core components that you would need to establish in order to make innovation work. And therefore, I have included the technology transfer in the middle here just to show you that this is core to innovation. It can be only a part, but it is a very important part. And you will see why as we move through the presentation. OK, so this is an overview of what I am going to be talking about. But first of all, I thought, since I'm standing in front of you and delivering this talk, you might want to know who I am and where I'm coming from. Then I'll move on to the core of the presentation, starting with what is innovation and what is technology transfer, and how these two are intermingled or intertwined. I will then move on to university technology transfer innovation, how universities and technology transfer must come together to make innovation work. 
And then we'll also look at industry, which is the opposite spectrum. Industry te and technology transfer for innovation. As Antonio mentioned, there is a massive gap between the universities and industry. When I go into different countries, when I conduct training sessions, I hear the same thing. We have a big problem. The industry does not want to interact with us because they think universities are a real pain to deal with because they are slow-moving, large organizations. Businesses are fast-moving. They want to get things done quickly. So there's a big culture change, culture clash. So let us have a look how we have overcome this problem. And let's talk about what Oxford's solution was to this. And then we'll move on to something called Global Innovation Index, which was actually formed by world's two well-known uh, well organizations in order to measure in innovation. So that is just to give you an idea what sort of measures should we take into consideration to measure innovation and what we shouldn't. Because what you can see out there is a lot of countries, a lot of governments, a lot of departments take into consideration certain criteria and measurements that are not the actual measurements of innovations. They are just outputs. We will move into a case study, Singapore. Singapore made this work, and they took very little time. Little country, about one and a half million people. Overall, I have more than 10 years of experience in technology transfer, commercialization, and innovation. Prior to ISIS innovation, I worked for University of Warwick's technology transfer unit. University of Warwick, again, is a small university, but they are in the top 10 universities in the UK every year, mostly in the top five or six, without a doubt. And when I worked there for two years, that's where I got to um, directly involved in technology transfer from a university side of So I got direct experience there. Prior to that, I worked in a company called Innovation Exchange as a consultant for two years initially in Australia, and then shortly back in the UK. So here, this company is a um, technology brokering company. They have a look at technology providers or generators, such as universities, and they connected these technologies with companies or technology seekers and helped them to commercialize. This is where I learned the most. I co-founded this company straight after my PhD. And I think I am a good role model to the students because students always approach me and say, we don't have any business experience. We are science students. We don't know about writing business plans. We don't know about anything about intellectual property. When I first started putting this company together, I was in my second year of PhD. I had no idea what a business plan was. I had no idea what a patent was. And at the time, this was back in 2001, 2002 period, technology transfer was not well known. I, had, I hadn't heard about this particular uh, phrase that you use as technology transfer. So I had to learn everything myself the hard way, making mistakes and learning and moving on without feeling bad about it and giving up. So I co-founded this company, ran it for four years as the chief executive officer, and that's where I got exposed to commercialization.